On debate, Senator Munson. Uh, honorable Senators, um, there is a saying, you can seek the wisdom of the ages, but always look at the world through the eyes of a child. I've said it many times in the chamber and the work that I've done in, in children's uh, groups and organizations over, the, over many years. When I was uh, first appointed to the Senate, I was asked by a reporter, what would you like to be in the Senate? I said at that time, and there was a little headline in the Ottawa Citizen said, uh, Jimmy Munson, he wants to be the children's senator. And uh, of course, I had my mentor in, in Landon Pearson at that time. And so in talking about children over all these many years, 15 to 16 years, we have made some headway and we have been stopped at many spots along the way by successive governments of not listening to what we've had to, uh, what we've had to say here in the Senate. But honorable senators, I rise today to speak at second reading to support Senator Moody's bill, uh, S-210, entitled an act to establish the office of the commissioner for children and youth in this country. Uh, Senator Moody, this is your second time introducing the bill, a bill which at second reading is in principle is solid and necessary for a better country a better Canada for young people and their futures. The Office of a Child Advocate is not a new idea. In fact, uh, Senator Moody's bill is long overdue. Uh, there are still a few senators around uh, in the day when we uh, passed a report in this chamber over a decade ago uh, dealing with Canada's obligations to the United Nations UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and promises made to First Nations and Indigenous children uh, we spoke at that time and we delivered, we delivered a report, uh, but successive governments didn't really listen. Uh, but there's something that we don't do here, we don't give up. We never give up in the Senate. Uh, we are an institution that cares about minorities and we certainly care about children and we never give up. Today, uh, the current unpredictable situation of COVID-19 has shown that impacts on children often come as a as an afterthought after major decisions have already been made rather than in tandem. It's more obvious than ever that Canada's children need and deserve a Children and Youth Commissioner's Office. Now, first let me uh, say how reassured I am how to hear Senator Moody say that she will not stop on this issue, that the Office for Children and Youth is one of her missions uh, in the Senate. I hope, and I really do hope, that Canada will create a federal child advocate office before my retirement, which is just about nine months from now. But if not, I'm assured to know Canada's children will have your voice, Senator Moody, your voice, and others uh, in this chamber. And also, Senator Moody, uh, don't, don't worry about how many times you have to introduce a private member's bill. Um, I had to introduce a, a private member's bill on World Autism Awareness Day a bill that you would think that would be very simple. Uh, but with prorogation and other things and the, some people not liking the idea of why are you having another awareness day? Well, you've seen where that's gone uh, for the autism community in this country because of the work both here and elsewhere. Uh, I had to introduce my bill five times uh, between 2008 and 2012 before it was finally made into law. You'll get there. Trust me you will get there with perseverance, and I'm sure we all in this Senate will support you. And that's uh, uh, some advice I'd like to share with all senators here, actually. Uh, don't stop trying. Don't stop reintroducing and pushing your issue uh, forward in this place, because that's what we're here to do. Uh, no matter who may like it or not, do what you know is the right thing. Stand up for minorities, and in this case, stand up for children. It would be impossible for me to talk about children's rights and not mention, as you did, Senator Moody, a friend of mine, a mentor of mine. Uh, Senator, former Senator Landon Pearson was the one beside me as uh, trying to haul you into the chamber reluctantly. Well, I ran in. It, I didn't, wasn't reluctant into coming into this chamber because I had an opportunity to have a third career and I had something on my mind about children and disabilities and this uh, place has served as an institution to deliver that. And Senator Pearson 
uh, who was an advisor to Foreign Affairs Minister on Children's Rights in 1996. She started National Child Day here in the Senate, and we had a wonderful thing going on here, and I hope we can continue to do this. It took two men to do Senator Pearson's job. Uh, Senator Mercer and I took it over when she left, and then we brought in uh, Senator Cochran from the Conservative Party in Newfoundland, and then we were, and, uh, we were on our way, but it took about the three of us to do her work. And this has been a joyous place in, for National Child's Day here. We, uh, we've, had, we've had the very naked ladies in this Senate singing. We've had peop uh, young children or children just talking the talk and talking about their issues, and all because of Senator Pearson. And uh, she's about to turn a certain age very soon, uh, I know, and you can't say somebody's age, but you'll figure it out. You just you know, Google it and you'll find it. But there she is at the Landon uh, Pearson Center uh, for the Study of Childhood and Children's Rights, still working at, at all this work at Carleton University. And she spearheaded the important committee work during her time in the Senate. She was a deputy chair of the Senate Human Rights Committee when we studied Canada's obligations on the rights of the child and we released an interim report in 2005. Now, although she had retired, retired two years earlier, the final report, titled Children, the Silenced Citizens, was finally adopted through the good work in this chamber in 2007, at that time with Senators Raynell Andrichuk and Senator uh, Joan Fraser. Uh, dear friends, how time flies. And they were so solid in this work on this report following Senator Pearson, and they were the chair and deputy chair, respectively. Now, this might sound familiar to what we've already heard today. Our committee study called for an independent federal advocate for children with a mandate to monitor the implementation of rights of children in Canada, liaise with provincial and territorial advocates, raise the awareness of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, promote the inclusion and involvement of all children in institutions. Now, many of us have pushed every government since then to follow through on our committee report and the recommendations to appoint a federal office for children in this country. Governments, they have listened, but they haven't really acted, haven't acted enough. That is why Senator Moody's bill is so important. Asking hasn't been enough. We must act to give young people a voice. We must put it into law. It's disappointing for me that when I retire that I may not be able to see a, this report come into law. It does take that time and we're dealing in a minority government. Who knows what happens from day to day. But uh, inside and outside this chamber, we've all been urging action. But meanwhile, meanwhile, about 60 other countries have established national offices for independent child advocates. We, we've got to get beyond the curve here. Canada ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child almost three decades ago, and we continue to bring up the unfair discrepancy in the well-being of children in Canada. But as I said before, governments haven't acted enough, strong enough on those responsibilities. The Convention clearly outlines those absolute rights which children must be allotted in a free and fair democracy, namely protection from abuse and harm, the right to participate in public discourse, and the promise that children receive quality education and adequate standard of living. In UNICEF's most recent report card, I'll get this, Senators, Canada ranked 30th out of 38 rich countries for overall child well-being. The report card specified that Canada scored low in children's survival, physical, mental health and happiness, and low in supportive relationships. It is easy for us to agree that children have every right to participate, but we must provide them with the means and the tools they need to succeed. We need to create spaces for them to speak for themselves. An independent federal advocate will be a vehicle for young people's full participation in our democracy and participation in policy changes which directly affect them. Which brings me to another ethical reason Canada is obligated to create a child commissioner's office. Children cannot vote, and there's currently no formal independent body that can hold government accountable for decisions that affect them. Many nations have lowered their voting age to 16, 
to help address part of this gap. We see from examples like Scotland that lowering the voting age has increased interest in politics and civic engagement for young people. In fact, voter turnout was 75% for the 16 and 17 age group during a recent referendum in Scotland. Now, before I stray too far off the topic, I think a commissioner's office will be able to facilitate lowering the voting age in Canada while helping give a voice to those who cannot vote. And I thank Senator McFedrin for her work, and which will go on, and I will support you on this. This change would help fulfill our obligations to the rights of the child under the Convention, particularly the right for young people to be heard and influence policies which affect them, not to mention other positive outcomes, in, including more voices in better government policies and legislation, and just perhaps higher voter turnouts in the future for others who are no longer children. A children's commissioner is an investment in the continued health and safety of future generations, as well as a mechanism through which young people may become more, become more politically involved and motivated. Investing in our next generation and generations to come makes good ethical sense. But it is also economically advantageous. According to a conference board report, for every one dollar of investment in early childhood education in the present, we will get back six dollars in the future. A federal advocate will ensure that Canada is making appropriate investments in children, as well as, as, well as making progress towards implementing the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The office would also work collaboratively, collaboratively with First Nations, Métis and Inuit people and Innu people with the goal of monitoring progress on the government's implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. The recommendations of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, all with the goal of achieving measurable better outcomes for children in this country. Excuse me. It's dry in the Senate, isn't it? But let me uh, share a story with you. Uh, and this is uh, personal. Uh, Almost two years ago, I had the privilege of introducing Dr. Cindy Blackstock at a conference on intellectual disabilities in Winnipeg, in Manitoba. Her presentation that day, and it was a typical day in Winnipeg, it was cold. Her presentation made a big impact on me, and that was the, with the warmth and everyone in the room. And most of you know the story, but it has to be repeated. She told us a heartbreaking story of a beautiful child, Jordan River Anderson, a five-year-old from Norway House Cree Nation who lived with Carrie Feynman Zitter syndrome and tragically passed away. Dr. Bladstock shared Jordan's legacy with us by teaching us, teaching us again about Jordan's principle as many of you know, Jordan's principle is a child-first and needs-based principle used in Canada to ensure that First Nations children living on and off reserve have equal access to all government-funded public services. It says that First Nations children should not be denied access to public services while governments fight over who should pay. Jordan's story and the principle named for him have stuck with me, partly because the story is so familiar in my work in advocacy for children and families living with autism, we have been given the jurisdictional excuse game of provincial to federal responsibility over a decade, if not longer. While we argue, our children suffer. Indecision and procrastination have lasted long enough. It's clear a child-first, needs-based approach is what all children in Canada deserve. We should all learn from Jordan River Anderson's story. Jordan's principles should be the goal for all of our children. An independent federal advocate's office will be able to investigate issues that pertain to Canada's most vulnerable children, such as racialized children and those living with physical or intellectual disabilities. These groups experience discrimination far more than other Canadian children. 
they are also more likely to experience negative childhood experiences like poverty and abuse and more often report low levels of life satisfaction. We know that children with intellectual disabilities are at least two times more likely to live in poverty than their peers and much more likely to report feeling unsafe than children with no disabilities. I, I'd like to have a few, few more minutes. I, you, you know. Is leave granted? Five more minutes? Five minutes, thank you. Um, furthermore, it's well known that black First Nation, Métis and Inuit children are over overrepresented in the child welfare system, juvenile justice systems, and more likely to face discrimination at school. For instance, they are more often expelled or suspended at their school than their peers. Now, saying all that, children are the most reliant, reliant people in our population. It is essential that we take responsibility as policymakers to protect them. The commissioner could act as a bridge, would be able to better examine the inequalities that exist between children and adults and the multiple barriers facing vulnerable children across the country. There are over 10 million young persons in this country, and more than a third of them say they do not have a safe and healthy childhood. One quarter of children say they often go to school or bed, hungry, hungry in this country. Can you imagine? And you don't have to look too far from the shadows of Parliament Hill, having lived in this city a long time, to see that right here in the nation's capital. This year, children around the world have had their routines shattered, and see, we see how their lives are being altered as a result of the COVID pandemic. As we have discussed in this place since the spring, the pandemic has perpetrated these issues surrounding mental health, and instances of domestic violence have risen as well. Children First Canada, an incredible group, has this mental health data from Stats Canada that children rate their mental health as worsening because of the pandemic. This is what saddens me, the, these numbers. Suicide remains the second leading cause of death for youth aged 15 to 24 and is now also leading cause of death for children aged 10 to 14. Canadian children suffering mentally and physically more than ever. The RCMP's uh, National Child Exploitation Crime Centre has seen an increase in reports of child sexual exploitation, as has the Canadian Centre for Child Protection's tip line to report the online sexual exploitation of children. The latter has seen an 81% spike over April, May and June of this year. Those numbers, let them sink in. In closing, honorable senators, the wellness of children in Canada has been on the decline over the last decade, intersecting risk factors such as poverty, food insecurities, access to mental health services and family struggles have been compounded by the pandemic and have heightened negative impacts on young, young people. The pandemic has further magnified the evidence that Canada needs an independent federal advocate for children and youth. I'd like to quote from our 2007, 2007 committee report in this chamber, which was unanimous, which touches on the importance of inclusion. Children's voices rarely inform government decisions, yet they are the, one of the groups most affected by government's action or inaction. Children are not merely underrepresented, they are almost not represented at all. Last year, I was honored to sponsor the Accessible Canada Act, and during that time, we learned a mantra from the disability community. Nothing about us without us. As far as I'm concerned, this should be the mantra in policymaking. Let's not leave children out of the decision-making process. Their voices will provide for better outcomes and futures for all of us. We need to include them. Inclusion, inclusion as you know, is my motto. Senators, this bill in principle at second reading deserves to pass as quickly as possible and get to committee. I look forward to following the bill at committee and listening to the views of young Canadians from across the country. And Senator Moody, Senator Moody, I really want to thank you for your advocacy and for your love of children and, and their rights. Thank you very much, Honourable Senators.